So welcome to the online class of our course CVL 864. So today we'll derive the 1D impedance equation of Liang. So uh, basically let us just try to recapitulate that if we have a PZT patch and we apply an alternating electric field across the thickness so we show this kind of field by this symbol where there is a tilde symbol inside a circle so there will be alternating charges so here we are showing that the top side is positive bottom side is negative but it will keep on fluctuating so the charges will be alternating so such alternating quantities we show by this kind of bar on the top so this shows that this is the instantaneous value so we would be showing the current the electric field and the voltage by this symbol so in parallel plate capacitors we are very much familiar with the equation that charge is given by the product of the capacitance and the voltage across the to plates so we can modify this equation if for example we change the charge and write it as a product of the charge density multiplied by the area and similarly the voltage basically voltage per unit distance that is the electric field so this we can convert it into the electric field multiplied by the distance and the capacitance is given by epsilon multiplied by the area and divided by the thickness so we could very easily get to this form in terms of the charge density so this is the equation of the parallel plate capacitors basically so now here point to be noted which we had derived in the previous class also that this is the dielectric permittivity of the pzt material and this is complex number so it is called as the complex dielectric permittivity so it has a term delta and what is this delta so delta is basically the dielectric loss tangent essentially it signifies that there is kind of electrical damping so here we have the negative sign which means that the charges they are lagging behind the electric field now we had derived a parallel with the complex Young's modulus so complex Young's modulus we have a simple similar imaginary term eta but that is plus because in that particular case the strain lags behind the stress so let's now see the assumptions in the model our first assumption right now is that we are deriving a 1d case model so we assume that axis 1 is along the length of the pzt patch which is bonded on the top of the whole structure and axis number 3 is basically normal to it so it's along the thickness direction so essentially we have the x axis which is basically the axis 1 and we have the z axis which is axis 3 so y is basically normal to the plane of this slide so our second assumption is that force transfer between the PCT patch and the whole structure it is occurring at the ends of the patch only now this is again an assumption because in real practice a PZT patch is bonded to the structure by a bond layer typically epoxy which you have done in the lab also how the PZT patch is bonded to the structure so in that particular case the system consists of the PZT patch, the bond layer and the host structure.
but we are making a simplified assumption. So the real scenario is that if we are considering the system, the PZT patch as a sensor, then when there is any kind of strain in the structure, then there is a lag. So that means the strain on the structure is much larger than that produced in the PZT patch. So this is called as shear lag effect. Similarly, if the PZT patch is used as an actuator, so if there is a strain produced in the PZT patch, same amount will not be produced or transferred to the structure. The one transferred to the structure will be less. So whether it is used as a sensor or as an actuator, we will always see a strain differential between the PZT patch and the whole structure. So this is called as the shear lag effect. So we are ignoring this shear lag effect and our assumption is very simplified that we assume that the PZT patch is connected to the whole structure by sort of pins. Now how realistic this assumption is? It has a basis. So we assume that the PZT patch is essentially a bar and this bar undergoes actual vibrations and the end connections are like pin connections. So this is quite realistic in nature because when there is a bond layer, if we try to find out the variation of the shear stress, the variation of the shear stress is typically like this. So maximum stresses, they are concentrated near the ends of the patch. So that's why it is not that much error to simplify the connection between the P30 patch and the whole structure by pin-pin connection. Our third assumption is that there is no bending in the P30 patch. So P30 patch always remains in the actual mode. Even if there is a bending in the structure, the P30 patch does not undergo bending. So this is also an assumption in real scenario, there may be some bending effects, but we are ignoring that. Then our assumption number four is that the PZT patch is very small as compared to the host structure. So when we say that the impedance is a point impedance, so the PZT patch is connected at two different points, one and two, and they are finitely separated. So if we try to find out the drive point impedance of the structure, then it will be different at these two points because these two points are not same. But we assume that the PZT patch is small. Points 1 and 2, they are very, very closely spaced. So as a result of this, the two impedances, they are equal. So the implication of this condition is that because the PZT patch is very small, and the two endpoints they are very closely separated. So if the two impedances they are equal, that means the nodal line will be exactly passing through the center line of the PZT patch. So whether the PZT patch and the structure they are symmetrical or not, so this will always hold. So now taking advantage of the symmetry, what we'll do? will model only one half of the system. So we have the two parts. So the total length of the PZT patch is 2L. So what we are doing, we are only modeling the one half that is L and we'll derive for this one half of the model and then what we'll do, whatever the total charges, we'll just multiply by a factor of two. So these are our axis, axis number one along the length of the patch, axis number three along the thickness, and axis number two is going inside the plane, so normal to the plane of the slide. So let's say this patch is under alternate electric current, electric field rather, and then as a result of this alternate electric field, so the PZT patch undergoes vibrations, and it interacts with the structure. So structure is represented by the impedance Z. So here 
the electric field E3 is related to the voltage by voltage by the thickness of the patch. So it is basically the potential difference per unit thickness. So at the nodal point we have zero displacement. So this will use as a condition. So let us now derive the constitutive uh, relations. So we begin with uh, the equilibrium. We begin that let's say this very small and infinitesimally uh, small portion of the PZT patch. We see its dynamic equilibrium. So if we consider the dynamic equilibrium, then the small element it has uh, its mass equal to the density multiplied by the volume so volume is basically the width the thickness and the length so here rho is the density of the patch so if we now apply the Lambert's principle and look for the dynamic equilibrium of this particular element then we can write this equation so on one side we have the elastic force and on the other side we have the inertial force so that's how we write the equations of the dynamic equilibrium so we have the elastic force we have the inertial force but now you may wonder where is the damping force because all dynamic systems they must have the damper element also so you try to guess where is the damping force so we'll see in the next slide where is the damping force so when we solve uh, this equation and try to simplify it we get a compact equation <clears throat> and then we make substitution for the stress in terms of the young's modulus and the strain so this is basically the strain the first differential of the displacement with respect to the distance x now can you guess where is the damping so we have the complex young's modulus here so damping is included over there so the complex young's modulus we are representing as having a real part and the imaginary part so imaginary part is the representation of the damping so this equation we can then simplify so on the left side we have the second derivative of the displacement with respect to distance and on the right hand side we have the second derivative with respect to time and the two are connected by this variable c square c square is nothing but the ratio of the density to the Young's modulus now this is a variable separable type equation so it has a very standard solution like this that we have the space terms and then we have the time terms and there are two constants a and b which are to be determined so here kappa kappa is the wave number and uh, this is given by the square root of density to the Young's modulus multiplied by the angular frequency so let us now try to find the constants a and b and we apply the boundary conditions so the first boundary condition is that at the nodal point there is no displacement so now if we substitute this condition in the above equation we get b equal to zero so that means we have a very simplified equation so our b part this is not there so we have only the part consisting of the constant a so then we can always write the strain so what is strain strain is basically the first derivative of the displacement so u is representing the displacement so we can find out the expression for the strain and similarly we can find out the expression for the velocity as the time derivative of the displacement so basically if we see the velocity velocity is just j omega times the displacement 
So we have the sign function intact over there and in the case of the strain we get kappa outside and sign becomes cons. So let us call these equations as 2a and 2b because we will be using them again and again. Now the second boundary condition we use the definition of the impedance. So we say that the force is equal to the mechanical impedance multiplied by the velocity. Now here we are introducing a negative sign. Negative sign only means that if the displacement is positive means the PZT patch tries to enlarge itself. Then what kind of force it will experience? It will experience a compressive force. So that's why compressive force we are denoting by the negative sign. Nothing like any other reason. So with substitution of the velocity from this equation, we can get an expression for the force like this. So let's call it equation number three and I'll reproduce this equation later. So now we consider the direct and the converse piezoelectric effects one by one. So we begin with the converse piezoelectric effect. That strain is equal to the stress by Young's modulus plus D31 into V3 equation. We are very much familiar. So we can convert stress into force in terms of force, force by the area. And similarly, the electric field can be written in terms of the potential difference or the voltage. So now we can make the substitution. So strain we have to substitute. So strain we already have seen the equation that it is equal to a into kappa into cos kappa into x so that is strain so we substitute this and we find out the value for x equal to l that is at the end so we get this expression so here what we can see is that we have a so if we combine these two terms then we'll get some expression for a so that is the evaluation of the second constant that is a but now we want to simplify this equation further so we can get a from here directly but we'll wait for some time because we want to derive a compact equation so we introduce here one more definition that is the mechanical impedance of the pzt patch so what is mechanical impedance of pzt patch it's the ratio of the force to velocity let's say we have applied a force and we are seeing a displacement u. So we take a derivative of the displacement and we will get the from the ratio we will get the mechanical impedance. But then we have to eliminate the piezoelectric effect. So that's why we have short circuited the two terminals. Because mechanical impedance of the patch it should be determined in such a manner that the piezoelectric effect is not included. So now we can have a very compact equation that the mechanical impedance of the patch is the ratio of the force to velocity and velocity we are converting into in terms of the displacement and similarly for the first equation we have converted into strain by taking help of the Young's model. So strain value we have already expression in terms of a and similarly the velocity also we have the expression in terms of the sine function and of course there are the exponential functions e to the power g omega t and e to the power g omega t also with this so just refer to the previous slide and with this, when we do the substitution, we get here the compact value of the mechanical impedance. So I want to highlight the effect that no minus sign is used here. In the previous scenario, we had used minus sign because the force and the displacement, they were such that if the displacement is positive, force was compressive. But here, this is not the case. So if the displacement is positive, force is also positive tensile. So now, we can use this in conjunction with the previous equation and we can get a very compact expression for the constant a. So we have got both the constants a and b. So b is 0 and a has this value. 
so here z is the mechanical impedance of the structure and z is the mechanical impedance of the pzt so again we go further we again write the equation like this and now what we do we don't want to write expression at the end we want to write a general expression in terms of x so that means we substitute the value of strain at x so this is uh, a kappa cos kappa x e to the power j omega t and now we have the value of the constant a also so by this substitution we can get an expression for the stress in terms of all the constants so you just take note of the fact that we have v not and e to the power g omega t so combining this this is the instantaneous voltage v bar now we come to the equation for the direct effect that is in terms of the charge so we have expression for uh, the t1 already with us so we substitute the electric field in terms of the voltage and then we substitute t1 from the previously de derived equation so we get this expression for the charge density so now we can see that charge density is being shown as a function of x so charge density that means that it's not uniform it follows cos function now if we want to find the electric current so electric current what is electric current electric current is basically the rate of change of charges so if we uh, just take a derivative of the charge density we will get something like current per unit area so we have to integrate it along the area of the path so we should get the total electric current so that's what we have done in the next step so we have this derivative with respect to time and then we have done the integration over the whole area from x equal to minus l to x equal to l and along the entire width so we will make use of the fact that we integrate from 0 to l and we'll just multiply by a factor of 2 to take care of the other side so this is the derivative is basically g omega times the charge density so charge density we already have the expression so we substitute and we do the integration and after integration we get this value so again here there is v naught e to the power g omega t so this is the instantaneous voltage now our objective is to determine the admittance so what is admittance admittance is basically the ratio of the current to voltage so if we now take the ratio of the current to voltage instantaneous current to instantaneous voltage we get the admittance y bar so this is the final expression for the admittance so this equation is exactly same as derived by liang only thing is that we have a factor of 2 now y factor of 2 comes here because here we have considered the total length of the patch whereas in liang's derivation he had considered only one half so this is the capacitive component so this component is uh, sort of uh, doing that it is camouflaging the other component so this is the main component which is associated with the mechanical impedance so if there is any damage so this part changes and the other capacitive component does not change anything so now it's your homework that you separate this equation into real and imaginary parts in fact i had given this task to you earlier also now you just repeat that and you can find out which part will be larger g or b which will have higher magnitude and why now one more thing we would like to study before concluding that is the quasi static sensor approximation so quasi static sensor approximation means that a particular situation when the frequency of vibration is very low so if the frequency of vibration is low very less than the first resonant frequency typically less than one fifth of the resonant frequency then what will happen that the term kl by 
10 kL by kL, that will be very small because we are at very low values of the frequency. So 10 by theta by the, uh, 10 theta by theta, the limiting case, it will tend to 1. So we get a more simplified expression. So here there is no 10 kL by kL term. So this is called as quasi-static sensor approximation. Now the thing is that how do we get the resonance frequency of the PZT patch? So we get clue from the expression of the mechanical impedance. So what is the resonance frequency? Resonance frequency is that particular frequency at which the mechanical impedance of the PZT patch will be minimum. So now from this expression, what uh, value of the frequency we get this as minimum so clue is provided by this term 10 so 10 of a number we know that it follows this kind of trend that if we are varying theta from 0 to pi by 2 so the tan theta will be asymptotic to infinity at pi by 2 so that is at pi by 2 this will have infinite value so the mechanical impedance will be lowest so that gives us clue for the resonance frequency so if we have this kind of situation that uh, the kl is 2n minus 1 pi by 2 so it is basically um, multiple of the pi by 2 so n can be any number so here kl has to be pi by 2 or 3 pi by 2 that is 90 degrees 270 degrees or something like that so then uh, naturally z a will be minimum so it's your homework to find out the by this approach the resonance frequency of uh, these two sizes of p30 patches assume that we have p30 patch of grade pic 151 from pi ceramic and alternatively this can also be found if you use a plot of the z a value so what you have to do is just uh, plot this z a using matlab in the frequency range of 0 to 1000 kilohertz and from here also you can get the resonance frequency like this for example we have the real part we have the imaginary part and this is the modulus so what we find that it's minimum here so these are the resonance frequencies so we have the first natural resonance frequency second resonance frequency third and like this so for two different sizes you can find both the sizes so thank you very much i hope that your holidays are going well